we go. Um, I will begin, as Inez introduced, with After Agnes, which is a standard issue hospital gown upon which I embroidered individual sequins held in place by individual seed beads over the course of three years. Um, during this time, I was recovering from a, a traumatic hospital experience of my own. And in the news, the Affordable Care Act was being hotly debated. We're now thinking of as the good old days, I understand. Um, the title refers to a woman named Agnes Richter who embroidered text um, very densely and very furiously upon her hospital uniform and transformed it into a fitted bodice that described her fears and her life circumstances. She'd been a professional seamstress and then she was a patient in a German asylum for 40 years before she died there. Um, her work was saved and miraculously preserved by the German psychiatrist and art collector Hans Prinzhorn in his famous collection of outsider art done by mental patients. The technique used here is also used in Haitian voodoo flags, the sequin and bead embroidery, and it's a sacred one, creating a reflective surface meant to deflect negative energies and support the wearer. It's installed here at the Richmond Art Center in 2015 as part of an exhibition curated by Inez Brooks Meyer called Body as Agent, Changing Fashion Art, um, from which I know many faces in the audience from. The image you see here is a still from a performance I did with that piece in North Beach in San Francisco. Um, the space had been used up until this time as a sweatshop where fleece sweatshirts for tourists to buy were being produced. It was a basement, and the door to get downstairs to the basement locked from the outside. Um, in 2012, the shop was evacuated by ice and abandoned, and I know nothing further about the people who had worked there. What I can describe, what I can remember, is just the emotional weight that the space held. In it, you could feel very deeply two points that I, I was trying to make while I was making the work, and how a pervasive lack of humanity can affect those suffering from illness, and how capitalism can force such illness upon those without a choice. Next is Eclipse, which is a set of 28 handmade soaps cast into concave oval forms they are abstract, yet they're decidedly feminine. Um, soap was historically made with lye, and lye is a component that breaks down indigo, in the natural indigo process, or one of the processes that can be used. Um, and so the soap was meant to dye the washer blue as they used it and wash their hands with it. Um, I grew up in a red state, a really red <laughs> state. And although I made this piece years ago, the intent to change someone magically to dye someone or stain someone blue and have them agree you, agree with me and, and match my um, <laughs> match my needs has grown stronger with each passing month. <laughs> the number of objects corresponds to the lunar cycle and rests upon a tablecloth crocheted by my Polish great-grandmother. The dark, bruised-looking color of the soaps Resting on the vintage textile is meant to investigate intergenerational trauma and its cycle in our collective consciousness. Mostly, though, and very often, I make wearable art that can be worn any day. It carries my conceptual concerns with me. It bears witness to what I see and think and write about, and wearing my work in wearing my work, I get to shed daily light on deeply personal issues. It helps me to connect and heal. It can also be very humorous, or it can just be about marking time and be about the process. And that, to me, is the beauty of textiles and especially of wearable art. It's here for all of it with us all the time. So this sweater is the beginning of a series based on identity and privacy. It's my social security number, encoded into Roman numerals, and worn right on my back in public. <laughs> Which did 
which did produce some anxiety the first day. <laughs> Someone's going to know, and they're not going to know. <laughs> the circular yoke makes it unknown to a viewer where the pattern begins, so that the number is still made private. Unless you're a knitter, and unless you're also very savvy with Roman numerals. <laughs> Similarly, this piece is my uses my credit card number around the yoke, as well as a traditional Fair Isle diamond pattern, which is used to symbolize um, attraction for wealth to the wearer. This other sweater is a still from a performance that I did as the name of the character is Alchemy, playing with my first name, the word Alchemy. Uh, part of a group exhibition and performance curated by Allison Smith in conjunction with Southern Exposure. The folklore surrounding Cabled and Aaron sweaters indicates that the originality of the patterns, not just the garments, but the um, texture patterns in the garments were used to identify bodies of deceased laborers and fishermen. The sweater I, I made used a honeycomb pattern draping over the overworn muscles of my lower back, neck, and right arm. And so here I'm dressed as a miner peddling medicinal gold soaps cast in bricks of gold throughout Market Street in San Francisco. There they are. The work was important to me in two major ways and helped me grow. First, it let me play with period dress in a way that felt new to me. Um, it let me elaborate upon folklore in a way that felt like playing a cross-generational game of telephone without any true regard for accuracy, which can, can catch you up. <laughs> um, and second, it allowed me to step into the role of a healer, a public servant, for the first time. I began this series, Dentata, thinking more about identity and individuality the way I had with the Roman numeral sweaters, um, thinking about how a body could be identified by dental records. Um, the wearer's dental records, I guess. I used digital x-rays from my dentist to create the pattern for the series. But as I worked on the pieces, I came to understand them more as about defending and protecting the body, my body. The imagery is more realistic than I've used before, and it's not encoded or in any way secretive. The bare teeth suggest a disturbed animal. <laughs> and the title dentata comes from the idea of a toothed vagina and suggests that an unwelcome touch will not go unpunished. The second dentata sweater that I made uses a damask netting technique, i.e. only texture so that it looks quite a bit more subtle. It's the tooth sweater I can wear to work and not have people comment on it, um, unless, unless I bring it up. So it looks more like um, the impression of a bite mark versus a graphic. I also just thought I would share the way I produce some of the patterns that I work with. I do it by hand on graph paper. I size the images and I pixelate them in Photoshop, but I render them by hand so that I have this working document that I can refer to on my desk. I make notes on it. As you can see, I highlight each row as I do it. I redo things. I cross things out. As I've started working smaller and finer and, and trying to get more recognizable, realistic patterns, it means that I'm working with fine thread, and so the garments tend to lose some of their handmade quality. Uh, Leo was talking about that with her, her pieces also, and I like that the drawings still retain that handmade quality. This is the current project called Local Lace. I worked with lace making pretty intensely while I was in graduate school at CCA. C. I, learned, I was the first year where it was not the sea. Um, I learned that in the 17th and 18th centuries when lace was so popular and unique patterns were as valuable as garden tech innovations are today, that lace makers were sometimes traded across national boundaries for their skill. For example, 
a Dutch lace maker might be moved to France to produce her lace there. And then the lace would be named and could still be named after the French city that she was relocated to and resided in. For this reason, I turned to using organic cotton grown by um, a fantastic farmer named Sally Fox in the KK Valley, close to us in, near Napa. Creating botanical work from the cotton grown on our landscapes feels powerful and political, an act of regional autonomy and even resistance. Using Irish crochet, a technique that shares a quarter of my lineage, I began making original lace motifs based on plants that I felt a cultural or medicinal connection with. This here is an arnica flower, known best for its analgesic properties. It's used as a muscle rub, an external anti-inflammatory, it's in most drugstores. It's however quite toxic, and you can't take it internally, you can kill someone with arnica. I began thinking of placebos and pharmaceuticals, and I began to turn to the seemingly magical qualities of some plants, how they're used for medicine, and how they signify femininity in dress. Floriography is a means of cryptological communication through the use or arrangement of flowers. And when used in conjunction with traditional plant medicine, the elaborate possibilities are both endless and quite beautiful. For example, chrysanthemums denote trust, and the seeds of Queen Anne's lace were used as emergency contraception for centuries. And the list goes on and on, so I remain fascinated with this. In Autumn of 2016, I was grieving the loss of my beloved cat that we saw pictured. And we as a nation, more than half of us anyway, were riddled with anxiety and sleeplessness, I'm sure. I had planted a new pot of catnip for her bravery after each of her vet appointments, and I made countless catnip leaves during those first dark months trying to strengthen my bond with my best friend and trying to soothe my insomnia with a known nervine present in most <coughs> time to formulas. Capsaicin, the chemical found in hot chili peppers, is also used in topical pain relief. It's more famously known as the burning oil used in pepper spray. The tiny bottle of protection that reality forces some of us to keep handy on our keychains to injure and temporarily blind an attacker. A group of flowers rendered together in a motif, as I'm sure you know, is called a spray of flowers. And so I thought, what if lace, a textile so tied to seduction and passivity, could convey, could convey consent for the wearer? These miniature plant sculptures that I've been crocheting lately do make their way into larger pieces. A taxonomy of healing, I suppose, and shown as a pepper spray lace collar. <laughs> However, in these challenging times, they are often given away to a friend who is terrified walking home one night, to a loved one recovering from a back surgery. They are how I'm marking these days and trying to create work while bearing witness to this shared trauma. Mm -hmm. 